thing that we do at Horizons is that we are life changed, life changers. And it's pretty exciting to look at that and what that means for Horizons because it means that um, through that int- intricate relationship with Christ and learning his ways and, and, and his hopes and dreams for our lives, our lives begin to change and we receive this life that only Christ can give us. And then as we move along that we begin to see also that it's not just all about us. It's not all about getting healed and just kind of getting what we need to get through the week but that it's about how then all of that life change in our hearts begins to flow out and affect others' lives. And that's really when it gets sweet as we see beyond ourselves and we see the bigger picture of this life that's been given to us. So we celebrate that. I want to invite you to celebrate that with us. We are in a, um, a moment uh, between two sermon series. We just finished up with our movie sermon series. And that, uh, that's going to be something that we continue to do because we've been taking just pretty simple movies and then uh, letting the Holy Spirit uh, lead us into where the gospel is in the midst of us or how it leads us back to the gospel. And that was pretty awesome. Plus, it was a lot of fun watching some movies together. Um, but next week, we're going to start our series called The Young and the Restless, and we're going to study the second part of the book of Acts and this crazy brand new church because all kinds of things are happening there and reflecting on it, learning from it, and uh, getting just this deep insight into what it means to be the church today and, and refreshing our hearts. So today, though, we're going to take a moment just to talk about what it means to be a life change, life changer and talk about some of that visioning that, uh, that God has for us. Now, I want to invite you, um, every time, let's go back one slide, Dennis. Every time you see that little H over there, that's horizons, really, in a nutshell. It's the energy that we live, breathe. Uh, it's the life, the light, and the freedom that comes from that, that how we talk about salvation. It's the light after the dark night or the empty tomb right here. It's that light that comes out of that. Every time you see one of those, there's an opportunity for you to make a reference to this worship outline that's on the backside of your program that you received as you came in today. And uh, I invite you to just to follow along. And uh, it, it's a great way to be participatory in the service, but it also gives you a chance to take this home and, and let it be a part of your week. Because we believe that God's Word doesn't just speak to us um, on Sundays, but that it's there for for us all throughout the week. And, uh, and this, this program is really chock full of stuff because in addition to that, on the inside, we're lifting up prayers. Horizons, we're, we're striving to be more prayerful as a community. And there are always going to be prayers in the inside of your program that you can take home and actually pray for during the week. We're always going to be lifting up schools in the area, um, knowing that that's a, that's a huge thing that weighs on our hearts. We're going to be lifting up a mission um, aspect or a concern or a goal that we have, and also one of the ministries here at Horizons. And, uh, and so I just invite you to consider this. This is kind of like your your uh, survival kit that you could take with you during the week. So today, this, uh, today this message came out of a conversation that I've had twice at Horizons. And when I was first here, uh, Sarah and I have been here, my wife and I have been here three years, two months, and a couple days now. And uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, Praise God, you're kind. <laughs> And our SPRC chair, that's our Staff Pastor Parish Relations Committee, no one knows that, but um, it's, it's kind of our HR team. And they're the ones that kind of walk with me and, uh, and, and hold me to the fire and make sure I'm doing my job. Um, but uh, the great team, very supportive. But I remember the second Tuesday that we were meeting, one of the people on the team that was, was very, known for exacting a, a response for some things looked at me and said, You know, it's really great that you're here and you're the new pastor and everybody loves you, but what's your vision for this church? What are you going to do? We need to know that. You know, we don't want you to just be here and and have fun. We want to know what your vision is. And I I was really excited in that moment because, you know, I was still young back then. Um, Apparently I'm not anymore. (laughs) I just had a birthday and people were like, now you're old, closer to 40 than 30. Um, And, but back when I was young, I was like, Oh, yeah, great question. And I was like thinking in my mind, like, I, I, I've been here just a couple months, but like I can eat it, breathe it, taste it, see it. I know what the vision is here. I'm so excited to just go there. And then um, I was like, okay, so let me tell you what it is. And then I, I started to try and put it into words what my vision for Horizons was. And I, and I just stood there kind of silent. I thought, oh, no, <laughs> nothing's coming out. And uh, so I was asked what our vision was, and I, and I couldn't, actually enunciate what it was, or I couldn't put it into words. Now, it's actually true that uh, at that point, I probably shouldn't have had 
uh, too much of a vision for Horizons because um, we're doing this together, which means we needed to walk through the waters, dip, dip our feet in the waters, or walk through the fire a little bit. We needed to hurt a little bit together. We needed to, to see some uh, things really go well for us uh, and do that life before, we, before some young whippersnapper could come in and say, hey, this is where we're going. It's going to be really awesome. Just a couple weeks ago, one of you, uh, I didn't know this guy very well from Horizon, he says, hey, we should get together and get coffee sometime. And uh, it would be really great. I'd love to hear what your vision is for the church. Oh, no. <laughs> so I had to meet him again. You know, I had to meet a guy, and I, and, I, and I started thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm not quite sure. Like, I, here I go again. I'm going to have to tell someone what my vision is for the church, and I can, I can smell it. I can breathe it. I know it. I can taste it. I know it. I can see when it's really good, and I can see when we're not meeting on that vision. And yet I, was, I was still had that moment in my, in my heart where I was thinking, what do I tell him? But here's the brilliant part. Over, we started this process in April where we, uh, we started calling it a 510 plan for Horizons. Now, we like to call things what they are. We have a new people party. I bet you can guess what that's for. Um, and so we call this the 510 plan because it's a plan that we are seeking and discerning for where, now hear these words, where God is taking us into the future, 510 or 10 years. Um, and so we really wanted it to be uh, very, very spirit-led, not just our own ideas of where we think we should be or how cool we think we should be in 5, 10 years, but really discerning God's vision for us. And so we've, we, we had some boards out there, and we invited you to tell us what's on your heart. How are we going to reach seekers and doubters? How are we going to see more transformation? How are we going to build Jesus' kingdom here on earth um, as it is right now? And we got lots of really awesome feedback. And then we built this team and we did some more discerning. And we did some praying. We read a lot of scripture. We, we studied some other churches. So we've been through this whole process over the summer and poured a lot, a lot of prayer and a lot of resource into this and a lot of, a lot of just heart energy. And uh, what's really cool is that as I was um, preparing to have this awesome coffee, um, although I was still a little bit nervous about what I was going to say, uh, God's really laid it on our hearts. What his vision is for this church, what his direction is for this church. And uh, it, was, it was brilliant to be able to share uh, where we actually believe that God is leading us, where we're going. Now, um, it, it's still in the final refinement uh, so I'm going to leave you hanging there. I'm not going to tell you what, what God has revealed to us. You're going to have to stick around to hear that. <laughs> that was kind of me, I know. But, um, but it's really exciting. But here's the thing is uh, even without those specific things, there's been a vision that's begun to culminate and, and, and who we are has really started to come together in things that make sense that really give us life. And, uh, and that's really exciting. So even today... I want to share with you a little bit more about what God's been laying on our hearts. One of the primary scriptures that we've been um, considering as we did this 510 process was from Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. Now, I want to invite you, if you want to join me, let's go there together. Um, and I want to remind you, as you're, as you're uh, getting your Bible, or if you're getting your smartphone, your tablet, device, whatever it is that you, however you follow scripture, um, that if you don't have a Bible today, yours is beat up or outdated or, or broken or lost or whatever, there are always Bibles. Bibles available on that little table as you enter into the worship center this morning. And I want to I invite you, if you don't have a Bible, or yours is, like I said, beat up, outdated, broken, lost, I want you to grab one of those. I want you to write your name in there. It's not a pew Bible. It doesn't get put back. It comes with you. Because we want, we say this every Sunday, we want God's Word to be in your hands, to work its way into your hearts. We want you to own God's Word. And we don't, it's not just read on the screen for you on Sunday mornings. Um, we, we really want that to be. We've given over a thousand Bibles out. And those are nice Bibles. They're not the super um, economy Bibles. Um, that's, that's where our hearts are. So um, as we dig into Colossians, Paul is writing to the church in Colosseum. And he's, uh, he's just on fire for what God's doing, for how Christ is moving in these people's hearts and how the Spirit's working. And, and he's just celebrating. Paul does a lot of this when he's, when he's writing letters. Um, and so Colossians, which is, by the way, it's in the very last section of your New Testament. It's one of those letters that Paul's writing to people like us thousands of years ago, encouraging us. And he's talking about all this uh, good stuff that's happening in the community. In verse 9, he says, Because of this, since the day we heard about you, we haven't stopped praying for you and asking, for you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. 
and with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Did you catch that? So essentially what Paul's desire for the church is, his vision is that we'd be filled with the knowledge of God's will and we would be filled with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's huge. And verse 10, he says, we're praying this so that you can live lives that are worthy of the Lord and pleasing to him in every way. Imagine that. Imagine looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, I actually believe that I am living a life that is worthy and pleasing of you, Lord, in every way. Even as your pastor, I will confess that I don't know if I can say that every day, but I hope someday that I can, you know, hand in my little passport and that I get more stamps in the accepted and approved area than I do get rejections, right? Right? that we live a life that's worthy and pleasing of the Lord. So that's, that's, that's the ultimate vision of the church. Now what Paul does, and, and um, you can actually follow along with this on the worship outline, he outlines four things that we get to be involved in um, as, we, as we dig through this and what it means to meet that ultimate goal of being filled with wisdom and spiritual understanding in a way that's pleasing before the Lord. And he says, this is the second part of verse 10, the first thing is by producing fruit in every good work. That means actually not just being here and getting filled up as we come, oftentimes we come as needers, but also then becoming feeders and leaders, that something's coming out of us. That's why we call it life changers works that we become this vision of the church by the fruit that we produce in every good work and paul says same verse and by uh, growing in our knowledge of god now this isn't just book smarts this isn't just like and you know i can memorize all the books of the bible and i can i can uh, tell you in order that how the disciples came to christ and um this is also knowledge Knowledge is understanding, it's a relationship, it's a depth in there. The third thing then that Jesus says is by being strengthened through his glorious might so that you endure everything and have patience. Even as Christians, even as people seeking after Christ, we go through hardships. There are things that hurt our hearts, there are things that destroy us in our lives, there, there are mistakes that we make that end up hurting other people. And a vision for the church is that we actually uh, can hold together in that. That we can withstand that. And we, we can say, I oh, will not be broken in that. Endurance. And the fourth thing that, says, that Paul says is by giving thanks with joy to the Father. That's, that's probably the easiest one, right? Okay, so we can be a church by producing works. We can be a church by uh, growing in our knowledge of who the Savior is. We can, we can uh, be the church by enduring hardships and, and saying Christ is still Lord and King over everything. And we can be thankful. No problem. That's a snap, especially that last one. But how many times do we wake up in the morning feeling the weight of our lives, of our worries, of our work, of our families, and feeling that weight just squish to smithereens? like you might a cricket, because they're all over the place right now, squishing our gratitude, our thankfulness, completely out. Gratitude is, is, is surprisingly one of the most difficult things to cultivate on a regular basis. Truly, genuinely to wake up and say, Lord, I am more thankful than I am fearful. Lord, I am more thankful than I am worried. Lord, I am more thankful than I am disappointed. But this is what Paul says. Now this is why, I love this, because we talk about life, light, and freedom. Uh, we didn't just choose those words because they sound really catchy and they're really trendy and everyone's going to love it and come to Horizons. That's not it, friends. Um, we're, we're saying that because it's right here and we know that it is compelling because it's God's words because this is why we're doing these things and this is what it looks like. Second part of verse 12, Paul says, He made it so you could take part in the inheritance in light granted to God's holy people. It is for this eternal inheritance. It is for this life, this being brought into sonship and daughtership of the Lord, the one who called us, who created us, who made us, who loves us, who died to save us so that we might have this inheritance and this light. You see it right there, to step out of the darkness or to see the light shine into the things that are still dark in our lives or our, our, our hearts or our minds. He also did this Verse 13, he rescued us from the control of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Again, giving us life. And verse 14, he set us free through the, through the son and forgave our sins freedom. 
This is what we get. This is the vision of the church. This is what Paul, this is the picture that Paul was painting for the church in Colossae that was on his heart to say, hey church, this is what I'm desperately hoping for you because it is awesome when you get there, when you taste that, when you, when you sense it, when you smell it, when you breathe it, when you realize that you're swirling in it, it's awesome. And it's the best thing that you can connect to as you seek Christ in your life. So what does that mean for Horizons? Pretend we're at coffee and you're asking me, what is the vision for the church? We're, not that we aren't on our way towards this, but a vision, especially if it's from God, is always out in front of us. You see, my vision, my hope for Horizons in five and ten years is that we continue to become and grow as a community that is completely on fire for Christ, that it is, so, it is running through our veins so much so that we can't help but be compelled to just be involved in this. We can't help but, but be able to just we splatter it all over our friends, our family, and our strangers, and our coworkers, just that everybody knows, wow, look out for that dude. He goes to Horizons. Look out for that. She's, she's on fire. She, I heard she goes to that Horizons place that we, we just can't help it. That we're like, that we're, I don't know what the analogy is, but we're just kind of, we're out there that we're just filled with that passion, that energy. My vision for Horizons is that each of us, each and every single one of us, even, this is going to sound crazy, but even if you are our guest today, like I said, you are the body of Christ today, so this is on all of our plates today. Even, you know, whatever God's doing in your lives, that each of us learn to understand that we are on a mission that we're not just here coming to get something good or, or uh, getting some healing medicine as needers so that way we can just be filled up and have life resume good and everything can be perfect and, and nice in our lives again, but that we are together life changed, life changers, that we are on a true mission, that our purpose, our identity, our direction forward, that our community, our, 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 the thing that we do begins to happen with all of us that we have an opportunity to get plugged into an area of this ministry, whether it be um, the hospitality team or something like that. Friends, you're not just brewing coffee and setting it out there as a job. You are integrally involved, integrally involved in the ministry of building the kingdom. If you have children in Discovery Zone or Fusion or, in, or you know, they're not quite an empty nester yet, they're going through the high school ministries right now, I encourage you, and my vision is that we would own that and not just send them off to that. Someone else can pour into them and pour into their faith, but that we are all an integral part of that on a mission, that we are doing this together, that we have a goal, a sight that we see, and we say we're going to do this together, that it's not just filling a job because no one else will do it, but that we believe in it and we own it. A lot of times when people come to a new church and uh, they decide not to stay there, you know what they say? And I, I know this because I was trained in new church planning. They would say, um, you know, we liked it there, but oh my gosh, the second week they're already asking us to be on the worship team. And I wanted to say, that sounds like an awesome church. <laughs> because it's not that we're looking for new blood. That's not it. It's that we're inviting you into the fullness of the mission that we're not just here, that we don't just come here on Sundays and call it good and say, hey, see you next, next week or when, when we can get a chance to come back, that we're on a mission, that we believe in this and we get the fullness of that because we believe that what is going on in our lives and how we contribute furthers us together. That's my vision. I would love that. I would love to see everybody at Horizons in a small group, whether it be a home group, whether it be a disciple group or other, some other kind of constituency where people are sharing their lives. Sarah and I, it took us a while, so I understand when people say, you know, we're just having a hard time finding the time. We finally got into when we finally took that, that call really seriously. We joined a home group, and we started it from scratch, and we didn't ask anyone to help us. It was a little easier because I was the pastor. But, uh, but we, 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 got, we jumped in this home group, and it's been one of the most beautiful things that we've done. We have cried together. We have, uh, we have, we have studied together. We've prayed together. We've wrestled together. We've, we've called each other mildly bad names together. Um, We've done life together. And I want that for every single person in the church. Our home group meets every Sunday. There's no exceptions unless it's a really busy Sunday, but we meet every Sunday. And it used to be that we'd bring a hodgepodge of things because we eat together, but now we bring this feast, and it's amazing. We have some of the best food in Lincoln, Nebraska, at our home group. 
It used to be there where everyone kind of be like, oh, I don't know, but now we have this rhythm, and when we have a taco bar, there's like 60 toppings lining the countertop. And I'm like, yeah, this is good stuff. I want everyone to experience that. I want everyone to experience that when, they're, when you're in trouble or when you need help or you're having a health, a health concern or your child is being born too early that you can go to people and you can say, help me walk through this. I have seen that recently with several premature babies where uh, these women, you women, and I know some of you are in here, so I'm going to try not to make you cry, but like I was the third person to know because there were women in the church supporting and walking with these other women through that, that they were like, hey, by the way, she's delivering her baby this morning. We're all around and we're all coaching around. And I'm like, wait, wait for me. That's the church. And I believe in it and I love that. And I want that for every single one of us. We're not just trying to hound you and say, well, if you really want to be a Horizons person, you got to join a small group. We're like, hey, we want you to get this. We want you to love it because it's good, because it's Christ, because it's that community, because it is what is good. My, 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 my dream for the church is that we become people who are so authentic we, can, we have been authentic here at Horizons. We don't put a lot of provo- production value into things because we want it to be just how it is, where we are. And I love that because it allows people, we're not saying, hey, uh, you know, we don't care where you are and you can just be here and be yourself and do your own thing. Um, that's part of it, but we're also saying that we want you to experience this beautiful life and we don't need you to be here before you can jump in. God's going to go right where you are and he's going to take you from there and he's going to begin to develop this beautiful life for you. And I love how we can be authentic. And I want to, that my vision is that we continue to be able to do that while we also set this intentional desire to grow, to really let this be a thing for us that is at the top. That our faith and our, the life that fills us because of it is even higher and takes even a little bit more, I know this is dangerous talking right now, that it's even more important than flag football. I know, I heard gasps. It's even more important than that vacation that we've been saving for for years. Uh, That's crazy. But what's going to matter to your children's children? What's going to matter to your children's grandchildren? Flag football? I'm sorry, I love flag football. I wasn't very good at it, so maybe I'm a little bit upset. But um, (laughs) what's really going to matter? That's what my vision is, that we can sink into that. Horizons has been supporting a missionary, or excuse me, has been supporting an orphanage for 10 years. Over 300 girls have gone in and out of this ministry, have been supported by Horizons Community Church, the sole supporter of Praetheksha, of, of, um, of Project Hope. My vision is that there are about 40 or 50 feet folks that are, are pouring into that ministry and, and really supporting this orphanage. My vision is that we're all engaged in that. That we're all saying, my mission, my purpose on this life isn't just about me, but I'm reaching out to those children in India, and I want them to be able to know Christ. I want them to be able to have uh, enough food to eat and grow, and I want them to be able to see their lives flourish because other people love them who they probably will never meet, and that they can share Christ with others and say, someone who doesn't even know me poured into my life. I want us all to be engaged in that. And you may be a guest today and you're like, well, slow down, buckaroo. We just came in here because someone said it was kind of different and cool. That includes all of us. That's my vision, that we own this, that we're all alive in it. There are some young high school women who call themselves cakes for kids. They've been selling cupcakes to you all and to other various places. They've raised $5,000, over $5,000 so far. And they're in high school. That's my vision, is that we're all doing that. There's a lot more I could say about what my, my hope, my vision, my dreams for this church are, um, according to how God's leading us. And I believe that we can get there. And I just want to encourage us, because it's good. It's really, really sweet. And it's not just me uh, hounding on you to, to do the right things. It's letting our lives truly become enriched. Now, Paul paints another picture in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. And it's a similar picture, and you'll see some of the t- how it ties in here a little bit. But um, I also want you to see in this picture some of the reasons why we struggle as a community to get to the picture I, that I just painted. 
So Paul is, 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 again, he's celebrating in Ephesians. He's teaching everyone and reminding them who Christ is in this really unique way. And then he begins to say, um, this, is, this is why I, I love you so much, and this is why I want this for you, because this is what I want. Verse 16, Paul says, I ask that he will strengthen you in your inner selves from the riches of his glory through the Spirit. So he wants us to come alive in the Spirit. And you can see similar things that he said in Colossians um, in terms of that knowledge, that depth, that connection. Verse 17, I ask that Christ will live in your hearts through faith. As a result of having strong roots in love, I ask that you'll have the power to grasp love's width and length and height and depth together with all believers. So again, we're talking about this connection of relationships, of the Holy Spirit, of really being able to dig into this as a group to see our works flow out of us, our endurance grow, our knowledge, our understanding of who Christ is. Verse 19, Paul continues, I ask that you will know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge so that you will be filled entirely with the fullness of God. That fullness of God is that life coursing through our veins and seeping out the pores in our skin, blabbing out of our mouths and we can't even help it. That's what Paul's talking about, this vision for the church. And he says, ultimately, know this. This part of the vision is that we give glory to God. Verse 20, glory to God, who is able to do far beyond all that we could ask or imagine by his power at work within us. Glory to him in the church and in Jesus Christ for all generations forever and always. For all generations, your children's grandchildren. Glory to God. So what Paul is essentially saying is he wants to see this, and he wants to see it happen not through your neighbor. He's not going to just step in and say, hey, I'm going to do all this for you. Paul says, by his power at work within us. Now, on your worship outline this morning, this is, these are some of the reasons that we actually struggle to be that church that God's calling us to, that Paul is remarking on here in Ephesians Number one is that oftentimes, so we all st- seek to be strengthened because we come in here as needers and we, we need our lives filled up. We need to be completed. We need to be put back together. And, uh, and so we come in here as needers, but when we seek to be strengthened, we often seek to be strengthened by our own status and our own success rather than the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So Paul's praying that we become strengthened in the Holy Spirit, that this life fills us. And yet oftentimes, we pray to be strengthened by our successes, right? Whether we do well in school, the grades are right, or whether we look good in front of our neighbors, our friends, our family, um, whether, we, whether we meet the mark of success that we've defined in our, in our, our culture, in our society. That's where we get our, our strength from, or we hope to get our strength from. Rather than trusting on the Holy Spirit to breathe into us and say, you are good, you are valuable, you are mine, and I created you in a beautiful way because of who I am. Not, you are good enough because you succeeded in this or you're doing better than your neighbor. We struggle to be that church because we're seeking to be strengthened by the wrong things. The third thing is that we often choose, the second thing, sorry, we often choose to live by instant gratification instead of by faith. Now, Paul says, I want you to have this deep, rich, and robust faith. Now, faith says that even when it's uncomfortable, even when I don't understand what's going on, even when I don't like it, that I don't just jump ship and try to resolve it and make myself feel better. Faith calls us into the discomfort of the unknown or the uncontrollable or the unresolved. I can tell you right now, we often struggle with this. And if you think, you know, I'm not in that boat, I want you to think about a conversation that you've had with someone that you're kind of in tension with. And you might have been texting them or something like that. Or or think about doing this, texting someone that you're a little bit at at, at odds with. And uh, and, and so you text them and maybe it's something like, hey, I really, I'm, I'm sorry for that. Or I just want you to know I didn't mean that. Or that really hurt my feelings, but I think we can work through it. Text someone something like that. Send them a message. And then when you wait five minutes, and then ten minutes, and then an hour, maybe even a day, see how freaked out you get. (laughs) Because we hate the suspense. Faith requires living in the suspense. So instead, you know what we often do? We'll send 20 more messages and say, you know, I didn't really mean what I said, what I meant was this, or, you know, know, I never meant it anyhow, and you can just... uh, because we hate living in the midst of that discomfort. Oftentimes we will seek instant gratification. 
we will seek to resolve our discomforts. We will seek to, to take care of whatever might be bothering us rather than living by faith. The third thing is that stops us from being the church that, uh, that, that Christ really envisions for us is that the knowledge of God's love often only fills us with permission or apathy rather than the life of Christ. See, Paul saying, I, I hope it is that you come to know the depth and the width and the height and the length of Christ's love, that it is so vast and amazing. But oftentimes when we hear that, when we say, well, then we, then we say, well, if uh, God loves us so much and has poured out his grace upon us by his son dying on the cross, then it's cool. I can do whatever I want. I'm free. And we go there. And it doesn't really matter rather than understanding that this is an awesome, awesome, liberating gift and that it should inspire us to live as Christ is, to jump into Christ's life right along with him. The fourth thing is that we often tend to believe that God works apart from us or through the select few rather than us specifically. So we hear about how good God is and we say, well, then God's going to fix it. I'm going to sit back, grab some popcorn, my easy chair, crank it back, and, and just watch God just kind of fix everything. Or we look at pastor, the awesome staff, uh, this select few leaders, and we say, you know what, they are so awesome. Um, I'm, they're going to take care of it. I know it's good. It's, it's good. But the truth is that God says, through Paul's word, glory to God who is able to do all that we could, more than we could ask or imagine, by his power at work within us, we're us. You're us. It's you that God is calling to work through. God will do amazing things, things beyond our imagination. But if you say, no, no thanks, I'll pass on this, then God says, I'll pass too. If you're not in it, it's not going to happen. I guarantee you, God's going to outlast every single one of us. But it's up to us whether we want to stand by and watch that life that God has offered us, that purpose, that fulfillment that's beyond anything that we can imagine in our work lives or our, our sports lives or whatever it is. If we would just want to watch that go by, that's our choice. But God's saying, this is through you I want to work. Life changed, life changers. It's all there. This is oftentimes what's, what stops us from becoming the church that God has painted. But this is the invitation today. This is what I'm encouraging each of us to do today. One is to pray and to ask for the Holy Spirit to fill us and guide us. Because this is what church should feel like. Okay? I mean, don't just go off of feelings. But this is what the church looks like. It's, it's the experience that we have. I want you to pray for the Holy Spirit. A lot of you might say, I don't even know who the Holy Spirit is or what or, or anything, and you want me to pray that it fills my life? Yes, I want you to go, and I want you to start right where you are, and I want this to be your prayer for the next several months and say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Guide me with that Spirit of yours. I don't even, I, and I want you to say this to God. I don't know who, what this is. I don't know what it means. I have no idea, but the pastor told me I'm supposed to, so I'm doing it. I want you to say those words, and I want you to welcome the Holy Spirit into your life. It will take some time, but I want you to be filled with that. It is rich, and it is good. I want to encourage each of us to choose to live by faith, by extraordinary faith, by withstand some of the pressures and say, you know what, just because it feels good or looks good or satisfies me or resolves some of the issues or the suspense that I'm going through, just because it does that I will not do that because I see the cross I see Christ and I will stay the course regardless of what uh, what uh, what are those things that dis they're distractions <laughs> see, I was so focused I couldn't remember the word distractions that I will not be distracted by this I encourage you I invite you into that extraordinary faith I want to invite you to let God's love truly fill and motivate you that it's not just permission giving, that it's not just something that allows you to just step back and say, well, everything's good and everything's cool, that it inspires you, that it calls you and says, get on the boat, you are in the mission, go and do and see what happens. And I want to encourage you to embrace the fact that God has chosen you, every single one of you. You may be a guest with us today, and I think that is so awesome. You may be a Horizons person, and you're saying, well, I've done everything here, everything five times. It means someone else. No, it means all of us. I want you to I encourage you to embrace that today. 
that together we're doing this as God has called us. So here's the cool opportunity. This is what's going to happen as we study the book of Acts, is that we're actually in the, mid, in the midst of beginning our stewardship season. And that doesn't mean, hey, we just want your money, write your checks, and fill out your cards. What that means is we're moving towards a vision. We're moving towards what I just talked about, this sweet spot. And a, lot, a couple of our hearts are probably saying, whoa, that's... <sighs> we got to go to a different church. But a lot of you are saying, that's awesome. I didn't realize that's what I wanted, but I'm here and, and I want that. It's rich. And, and you know, it's going to cause some sacrifices to be made. It's going to cause us to really lock, 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 lock on and say, I want this and I'm going to do this. And it's going to be at the top here. It's about our time and our talents and our treasure. It's about our hearts. It's about trusting that God has called each of us and through us he will do far beyond what we can ask or imagine just as Ephesians says. It's about our commitment, our faith. It's about opening our hearts and, and, and learning to trust and learning to have this faith that truly rocks and rolls. After all, this is why Christ came amongst us. God in human flesh, humbling himself to be amongst us, to walk with us, to teach us, to weep with us, to get a little bit upset with us when we seemed like we had really, really thick heads and hearts. This was the Christ who came to live within us, that we might be brought back to him and that we might bring others with us, that we celebrate that richness, that life that is beyond any other life that we could hope to have that we could ever imagine trying to afford. 